Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all in today's webinar, Clean Skies Over Our Cities, Lessons from the COVID-19 Lockdown. I also welcome the three eminent scientists and professors associated with Columbia University who will be the speakers for today's program. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Columbia Global Centers Network and the Columbia Global Centers Mumbai, I welcome you to today's panel discussion. The Columbia Global Centers were founded as a presidential initiative more than a decade ago with the mission of supporting research and education and building partnerships between Columbia University and global communities to enhance understanding, address global challenges, and advance knowledge. We have nine global centers in different parts of the world. Our event today is organized in collaboration with our Beijing and Nairobi centers, and I want to thank Helena Xiao and Murugi Endirango for their support. I also want to acknowledge our deep appreciation for Renew Power and our advisory board member, Vaishali Sinha, for making this program possible. Our topic for today is entitled Clean Skies Over Our Cities, Lessons from the COVID-19 Lockdown. It's believed um, that about 90% of people worldwide breathe polluted air. Excluding 2020, in the past few years as the World Health Organization has maintained an ambient air quality database for 4,300 cities in 108 countries, and has noted that ambient air pollution levels have remained high and approximately stable with declining concentrations only in some parts of Europe and in the Americas. As 2020 was an exceptional year when residents of multiple cities in multiple countries were asked by their national governments to follow lockdown guidelines and to remain indoors to avoid the risk of COVID-19 infection, reports from global cities highlighted a decline in air pollution levels for the first time. Researchers have found that, um, you know, 10 of these major cities, and, and this is a study from IQ Air, you know, where you had air pollution levels of particulate matter uh, relatively high and you had high numbers of coronavirus cases and there was severe lockdown. At least in seven of those cities with the lockdown, there were significant improvements in air quality, including New Delhi, Seoul, Wuhan and Mumbai. So those with historically higher levels of M uh, PM 2.5 pollution witnessed the most substantial drops in pollution. But is this clean air phase um, already seeming short-lived? As world economies are now, and we can see this in the case of several cities, including uh, New Delhi, where we get a lot of uh, information from. So what are some of the continuities that are enabling air pollution levels to bounce back so uh, significantly in such a short time? As world economies recover, in, we can talk about what it means to recover or open up. Practitioners both from the environment and health sector are once again concerned about the negative impact of air pollution on environment and community health. So our panel brings together these amazing uh, scientists from Columbia University who work in China, India, and Kenya to discuss the status of pollution or air quality during this period of industrial show of lockdown and reduced emissions, as well as to analyze the opportunities for long-term gains. Drawing from their research, they will deliberate upon paths for strategic implementation of clean air policies and practices in energy management, consumer choice, and school and healthcare systems. But first, I invite Dan Westervelt, a quick introduction. He's an associate research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and the Godard Institute for Space Studies at Columbia. He has more than a decade of experience working at the intersection of air pollution, climate change, and atmospheric chemistry using physical modeling, remote sensing, and surface me measurement approaches. His projects have been funded by the National Science Foundation and the United States Department of State. He also serves as, um, as the U.S. Department of State supporting air quality scientists for Congo Kinshasa, Congo Brazzaville, and Accra, and a lot of his research is also in sub-Saharan Africa. Our next speaker will be Faye McNeil. She's a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Columbia University, where she's also the chair of the undergraduate program. In 2009, uh, Professor McNeil received the NSF Career and the ACS Petroleum Research Funds for Doctoral New Investigator Awards. She was also the recipient of the Kenneth T. Whitby Award of AAAR in 2015. She's an associate editor for ACS Earth and Space Chemistry, and I've had the privilege of welcoming her and working with her in Mumbai. And of course, um, a lot of um, you know her work is global, but also with a focus on India. And our uh, third panelist is Arlene Fiore, who is a professor in the Department of Earth, 
and Environmental Sciences at Lamont Doherty Earth Observat Observatory at Columbia University. For the past decade, Professor Fiore was a principal investigator with the NASA Air Quality and Applied Sciences and Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences teams. She has served on the Board of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate of the National Academy of Sciences and on the steering committee for the IGAC Spark Chemistry Climate Modeling Initiative. She's co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed papers and a recipient of the American Geophysical Union's Michael Wayne Medal. Uh, I'm going to start off this panel with asking a general question. Maybe each of you can tell us a little bit about your observations about the, sta uh, the status of air pollution in the three countries, um, you know, Kenya, India, and China. So why don't I start with you, Dan, and ask you, uh, um, you know, to, to reflect on the status of air pollution, give us, a, you know, just a background of Kenya. Thanks, uh, Ravina, and um, hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here this morning or this evening, wherever you are. Um, so in terms of air quality in Kenya, uh, Unfortunately, you know, air pollution is just starting to be routinely monitored in Nairobi and uh, outside of Nairobi, there's not really much air quality data at all. Over the past maybe decade or so, there's been a lot of individual research efforts where folks have gone in and maybe collected air pollution data for a couple of months or, you know, some subset of the entire year. So all this is to say that continuous monitoring you know, over a long period of time doesn't quite yet exist, at least publicly. Um, you know, there may be some private entities that aren't willing to share data that are doing it, but um, in terms of what's really useful for the public is that open data. And uh, so far that isn't quite there. So that's all to say that it is, it's difficult to say right now, you know, what is the status of, of air pollution in Kenya? Um, a lot of initial data is showing that you know, specifically in Nairobi, you have pollution level that's probably about 50% higher than the than the World Health Organization's uh, annual guideline for at least for PM 2.5 particulate matter, uh, and that's sort of a conservative estimate. And it's it, it there there could be it could be worse, um, but I think the take home message is, is that we're not quite sure yet exactly how bad the air pollution is. We we think it's probably uh, a way above uh, healthy standards, uh, but really a lot more work is needed. And that's kind of what my team is working to address. Uh, thanks, Dan. And the same question to you, Afay, about India. Sure. Um, and and my, my presentation later will go into some numbers, but, you know, air pollution in India is a very well publicized issue right now. Um, you know, it's reached crisis levels in, in many parts of, of the North during the winter time. Um, but even in the south and in, in areas which, you know, there may be less awareness of air pollution as a problem, there's still, you know, elevated levels of air pollution that are affecting people's health. In my observation, I think things turned a corner in 2016 uh, or so. There, before that, there was very little awareness of air pollution as a, an issue that needs to be addressed that's separate from, you know, a natural weather phenomenon or something like that. And I think that the government has taken a lot of leadership in, you know, increasing monitoring, as, as Dan said, and, you know, trying to put resources towards addressing the issue. There's a long way to go um, to address the issue, but I think that there's, there's an inflection point right now where things can change. Thanks, Fei. And in the case of China, you know, is this monitoring, I mean, both Dan and Fei talked about monitoring as a gap and, you know, what, what countries are doing or could do to monitor. So I want to understand from you, Arlene, about China, and is it also the case in China? Sure. So um, it, since you asked specifically, and first, actually, I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for the opportunity to be here. It's, it's really exciting to, to get to be part of this panel. Um, and so my impression in China is that monitoring is is quite a bit further along than um, in sort of the status of, of certainly Kenya and, and India, as, as Faye um, mentioned as well. And so I think that said, there's still, and, and actually I should say another major, major improvement in terms of monitoring is not just that records are being taken, but that they're also being made publicly available to the scientific community, which really enables research and understanding to, to grow. 
Um, and I, I'll talk a little bit more in my talk about some of the kind of recent changes, but since Faye mentioned kind of 2016 is a bit of a turning point in India, I thought I would mention 2013 is kind of at least in my perspective when um, the air pollution levels in Beijing and, and various cities in China really kind of hit the world news. Um, and in particular, I remember being in a meeting in January of 2013 where it was becoming recognized that there were really unsafe levels of particulate matter in Beijing at the time. In fact, uh, things, you know, sort of levels that I think in Delhi uh, we've become, you know, used to seeing and perhaps even exceeding. But yeah, I guess the, the other point I just wanted to quickly make is that one of the challenges with air pollution is that there's different mixtures of what this air pollution is. And so the responses to change, there's a lot of different kinds of emissions, I should say first, that contribute to air pollution. And the responses to changes in those emissions aren't necessarily linear. In fact, we know for sure that some of them are not. Um, and so we sometimes see things that even though efforts are being taken to reduce emissions, we might see increases in some pollutants. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in my talk, but I guess I just at the beginning wanted to lay out that that's where atmospheric chemistry comes in, in that we have not just direct emissions, but also formation of, of different pollutants through chemistry in the atmosphere. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, turning to the question on our minds, you know, we've, we've all heard about um, what happened with the global pandemic. And we've heard about the industrial lockdown and the, the hope that, you know, this has created a positive change. And that, you know, when we talk about environmental crisis, that this lockdown um, has opened the possibility for enabling us to envision and actually seeing results in terms of a positive change, you know, in the environmental sense. So, Aline, while I have you, what's, what is your perspective? Uh, did, do you think that the lockdown period did get us any gains in the air pollution uh, battle? I do. I think it's. I think it's done a huge uh, job in terms of raising our awareness that that actions that we take can make a difference in terms of clearing the air over our cities. That said, I think if we really want this change to be lasting, um, it means that we do need to start to transform some of our activities that, that go on in society. And my sense right now is that recovery is happening kind of just in the way that things were operating in 2019. Whereas it seems like, you know, since we're talking about turning points and change points, it seems like there really is an opportunity here to recognize that we could recover in new ways. And there's definitely some work that's been suggesting that if we want to make you know, a lasting difference that we really need to be thinking about, you know, it, I guess green would be the, the buzzword that's used frequently, um, but thinking about more sort of clean options to recovery. And actually one thing that I'll, I'll bring up a, just a tiny bit in my talk is also that it's, we maybe want to take this opportunity to think not just about air pollution in sort of the, the way that I think we, we are all interested in working on it, but also thinking about carbon pollution and, and climate change and opportunities to, to really make a difference there, um, which, which definitely involve some major, major changes in the way we go about doing things. Uh, thanks, Arlene. I know, Faye, you've written about this and you've written about, you know, um, what we are observing and what that ha what implications that that has. So would you comment on on uh, COVID-19 and uh, air pollution? Yes, I, I concur with everything that Arlene said. Um, you know, I, I look at this as an interesting time where, um, you know, of course, I've been locked down in New York, so <laughs> I see things from an American perspective. But I feel like society is open for, for change in a way that it hasn't been before as a result of this many crises kind of piled on top of each other. Um, and, I, and I've heard reports that in India, for example, um, you know, maybe the, the culture previously um, would not have been leaning towards allowing people to work from home, uh, but that many corporations observed that it worked. And, you know, in, in cities like Bangalore, for example, decreases in traffic were so remarkable. Um, and of course, the accompanying changes in air pollution were were good. Um, you know, so so things like simple things like this, which culturally we may not have accepted before, you know, maybe they'll they'll be adopted going into the future. We can be hopeful about that. You know, maybe decrease in, in business travel. We used to fly all over the world for 
for everything. Um, there was a certain expectation. Of course, I love traveling. I, you know, I can't wait to get back to India, but not everything has to be a, an airplane trip, I suppose. Yeah, but I, I, I do want to echo um, Arlene's point that, you know, in, in the geophysical scale of things, this was a, a short time period, right? So, um, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, in China and in the United States, during the lockdowns, um, environmental restrictions were actually relaxed and they haven't been restored yet. And so we all are anticipating that things are going to come back actually dirtier than they were before because of these measures that were taken to allow for economic relaxation a little bit. So, um, you know, we're not out of the woods yet, but we, I think that we have learned a lot from this period. Wow, that's sobering, you know, um, that's sobering. I mean, you're, you're provocatively putting to, for us, um, you know, a change in people's behaviors and attitudes, but at the same time, our dependence on a certain type of economic path um, also, you know, has propelled governments then to say, let's do it at the cost of other environmental um, regulations. So on the air pollution and, and, um, and COVID link, um, Dan, maybe if, would, if you would like to answer this, I would like to um, hear from you about, is there a direct correlation between the virus itself and, the, you know, and, and how it affects the human body and, and air pollution? I think it's a little it's a little strong to you know to talk about causal associations between um, in higher air pollution and uh, you know higher incidence of COVID nineteen infections. There are folks that are are working to try to make that connection, and I think right now you know they are seeing some kind of correlation uh, between areas over the U.S. at least that have higher air pollution that also have higher COVID-19 infections. But there's a lot of, I think, caveats and there's a lot of issues. And that in this particular one study that I'm really referring to here from Harvard was, uh, you know, it had a lot of questions. And one of the big ones is, you know, population. So all, like a lot of the COVID-19 cases are in population centers. You know, there are a lot of them are in New York City, Boston, uh, California. And those are also places where you have high air pollution. So there's a lot of confounding factors, I think, that um, call into question the uh, the connection there. But um, it's certainly something that is worth a lot more careful um, research and, and something that, you know, could be important. So maybe I'll, I'll let Faye sort of echo some of that or expand. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Dan said. Um, I will say that you know, we, we know that air pollution, especially PM 2.5, the small particulate matter, prolonged exposure to elevated levels of air pollution affect every system in your body. It, it's associated with many of the comorbidities that um, put people at a higher risk factor for, for COVID. So not only respiratory problems like asthma and COPD, cardiovascular issues, but also even diabetes, right? That, that has been shown to be a, a risk factor for COVID. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all, um, you know, for the reasons that, that Dan mentioned in terms of population density, the social and environmental justice issues of, of who gets to live in a clean environment and who doesn't, but also these simple medical facts about what air pollution does to your body. Um, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that there seems to be a correlation, but I think that, for example, the studies from Italy that were proposing that perhaps the particles are are carrying virus, the, the pollution particles themselves are carrying virus around, I, I don't believe that that's plausible. I will add that <clears throat> if you're following the, the news about the different transmission routes for COVID, that one of the main routes is through airborne pathways meaning that um, the, the respiratory emissions from people, just their breathing, their speaking, singing, of course, coughing and sneezing, but you know, it doesn't have to be such a dramatic event. Um, we're all producing a very, very small amount of particles um, from our bodies and that the, those particles may contain virus and that um, that is how this airborne transmission occurs. That level of particles is is very small, like even in the indoor environment compared to the other particles that would be there just from natural or, or pollution causes. Um, and it's it's not the same as saying that, you know, PM 2.5 on average outdoors would have virus in it. These are kind of separate issues, but they, they, are, part of, they are aerosol particles. You'll hear similar language when we talk about air pollution or when we're talking about airborne transmission of COVID. 
And, you know, just overall, I know all of you are going to address it. We see you since you brought about, you know, inequities of access and, you know, social justice issues as well. I mean, one of the inequities has been in, in, the, in the data that we have, and Dan, you alluded to it as well. You know, what we have in, from West Africa, what we is, is very, very um, data dark as compared to, uh, you know, what we have from Europe. So how we, are, how we measure and how we monitor and how we, um, you know, depute resources becomes, um, it becomes a big challenge. I know all of you have spent, uh, you know, significant parts of your life and your career working on this issue. So I would, I would like, uh, you know, perhaps uh, we can go at this point in into understanding more of your research, and um, and seeing what are some of the gaps that it's trying to fill. So I'm going to start with you, Dan. A great segue into what Ravina was just saying is the the air pollution data is is very sparse globally, and so this is a plot here of PM 2.5 monitors per million people. So it's like a density of how, um, how many air quality monitors there are in a, in a given country. And you can see that, um, you know, based on this scale here, most of Africa is uh, in the zero range. All India, India is kind of, you know, not doing much better. It's in this uh, less than 0.2 uh, monitors per million people. China, um, you know, still kind of, it, it has a lot more, but it also is still not into the higher ranges that we see in the US and in Europe. So um, this is a huge uh, problem and closing this data gap is um, going to be a, a big focus for uh, the future. And not only is there not a lot of data in these areas that, um, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, but to our best knowledge so far, these are also the areas that probably need the monitoring the most because they have the highest PM 2.5 or highest air pollution levels. Uh, and so this is a plot showing that where you've got over Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, India, and China, you know, your, uh, your PM 2.5 levels are well above the uh, sort of World Health Organization guidelines um, and then compare that to the US and Western Europe and air is much cleaner. So it's kind of a, a, an a unfortunate paradox that the regions that have the highest air pollution also have the least uh, monitoring and the least ability to, to know exactly how, how bad it is. So one thing that um, I'm working on is uh, addressing this air pollution data gap specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we've been uh, for the last three year, two or three years, been deploying um, monitors throughout Sub-Saharan Africa in about seven cities or so, which are, are kind of marked there. Uh, one of these is in Kenya and Nairobi, um, also working in Uganda and Kigali in East Africa, and then some places in Central Africa and some places in West Africa as well. So um, we have about 50 uh, devices right now and, and kind of growing um, as the time goes on. And we're using a mixture of what are called low cost sensors and what are called reference grade monitors. So low cost sensors are, are, as the name implies, a much cheaper alternative to uh, monitoring air pollution. And it can be PM 2.5, it could be ozone, it could be NO2, it could be a, a variety of different pollutants. The only problem with it is that they are less reliable. Um, they cost less, so the quality of your data is also not as great. So what we have to do is um, use careful, you know, scientific methods and, and calibrations and correction factors to basically get useful, actionable data out of these cheaper devices. Because these, these low cost sensors may be a good pathway forward in data sparse areas and also in resource limited areas. So unless, you know, funding for air quality in Africa suddenly shoots through the roof, there's just not a lot of attention right now. There's not enough money and resources to go around to instrument uh, the the entire continent with the you know research grade instruments that can cost like hundred thousand dollars per device. These low cost sensors can cost something like a few hundred dollars per device. So you know several orders of magnitude lower. Um, and this is just a sample of some of the ones that we're using. Um, this is some photos of me working in some various uh, places in in Sub-Saharan Africa, essentially installing. Um, low cost sensors. Um, so I've, you know, Kampala, Nairobi, uh, Kinshasa, Accra, and Lome. And an example of what we can do with this data actually is very relevant to this COVID-19 lockdown issue. So I wanted to share um, the, the COVID-19 
story for uh, the city of Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is um, a, a city of about 15 million people. Uh, it's the largest French speaking city in the world. And until a couple of years ago, it had no air, air quality monitoring. But one thing we were able to do is take our data from April of 2019, which is presented in the red uh, line here. And this is PM 2.5 on the x-axis and hour of the day on the, or sorry, on the y-axis and hour of day on the x-axis. We were able to take our, our data from April of 2019, and that's in the red, and compare it to April of 2020, which is in the turquoise. Um, the, the lockdown in Kinshasa was approximately April 6th to April 20th. Um, but during that period, you can see that the air quality was a little bit worse in 2019 versus 2020. So there does seem to be some actual appreciable uh, impact of the COVID-19 lockdown. And this is the same is true for most cities around the world. Um, we saw this kind of um, maybe like 20 to 25 percent change. It varies by location, but it was it was a fairly uh, substantial decrease. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that a lot of this work is falling under the umbrella of a new project uh, that um, Professor Faye McNeil and I are leading uh, called the Clean Air Toolbox for Cities Initiative. And our goal here is basically to do a lot of what I've already talked about, tackling air pollution in uh, cities in the global south. And so we've established a, a large group of Columbia expertise, um, whether it's from the Columbia University Earth Institute or the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, the sort of Earth Science Wing where, where I'm located and where Professor uh, Arlene Fiore is located, to the Engineering Department where Professor Faye McNeil is located, and then several other departments that are also very important, policy, law, public health, any sort of relevant field to this air quality issue, we're kind of decided to work together on this and try to make some change happen in the Global South. So uh, just a quick overview of a couple of different projects that have come out of this effort um, that we are, are spinning up um, that, that are mostly seeking to address this issue of how do we address the air pollution data gap in not just Africa, but in other countries as well. And so we've recently got this five-year NSF project that's going to establish an international network of networks. Um, so that's sort of NSF lingo for creating this big consortium um, that allows for a forum for exchange of ideas, exchange of data, and exchange of knowledge among all kinds of interested parties in the air quality realm. So this can be scientists, policymakers, citizens group, the private sector, other stakeholders, basically, you know, anyone sort of interested in this. And so our goal is to bring these folks together and work on getting improved data out of these low-cost sensors. So I mentioned that they are a promising future application for closing this data gap but they come with caveats and there's really a lot of scientific uh, legwork that needs to be done to get useful data out of these things. So that's sort of our goal. We build this network of networks, which are shown here in the figure. Um, on the left is kind of where we started with how these different groups are connected to each other. So we have groups from the US, the um, what we're just calling like international global that kind of have multiple domains, China, India and Africa. So uh, we have kind of a lot of different representation, especially from India and Africa, where I think we hope to uh, apply our, our research in, uh, in the most direct way. So that was uh, one project. Another project that I'd like to tell you about is recently funded by the US State Department. Um, and the point of this project is specifically to focus on East Africa. And so this is Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. That's the, 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 um, the scope of this project. And what we really want to try to do is improve air quality in, in East Africa through capacity building and knowledge sharing and uh, building up a community of practice on this topic in these East African countries. And some of our key ideas for this project is um, one, to develop and implement an air quality certificate program in at least one local university in each country. Um, and so this will be spearheaded also with local expertise at local universities. Um, so for example, we've partnered with the University of Nairobi, with Kenyatta University and with JQuat in uh, Nairobi or in the Nairobi area. And then other universities such as um, Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, Makarere University in Uganda and uh, CMU Africa in Rwanda and Kigali. And so our goal here is to basically train the next uh, generation of air quality scientists and managers 
um, through providing them a sort of in-house um, certificate curriculum type program that can then really uh, set them on the path to developing and implementing air quality policies and plans that can improve the air quality in the future. And so we have city government and environmental officials that are involved in the project. And one of our, our goals is to also uh, build a locally owned monitoring network. Um, so we will provide equipment, we will provide the expertise to install the equipment and the training to do that. Uh, and we really wanna focus on sometimes what are called secondary cities. And these are cities that uh, are you know, not the capital city. So in Kenya, not Nairobi, but maybe Mombasa, Kisumu, things like that. Um, these are places that have very, very little monitoring. I mean, if you think monitoring is rare in the capital cities, it's almost non-existent in some of these other cities, which are still very highly populated, you know, maybe a million people in some cases, and, uh, you know, therefore could be quite polluted. Um, and then one last thing is that I've been working closely with the Columbia Global Center in Nairobi. And so uh, since they're kind of co-hosts on this event, I wanted to give them a shout out. Um, in August 2019, we held a roundtable in the Columbia Global Center of Nairobi uh, just to get folks together that are working on this issue and to see how um, you know, we can help and see what, what are some of the next steps for, for research. And then more recently, um, the Columbia Global Center has been very kind in allowing us to uh, house our um, reference grade NOx analyzer that was purchased via the Cleaner Toolbox project, which I mentioned. And so this is going to be finally located at the Kenyatta University City Campus. And this will be, as I understand it, the first NO2 or NO NOx measurements that have ever um, happened, at least in a long-term continuous manner in Nairobi. I'll go ahead and address the question that was in the Q&A. So the question was about the relative importance of developing air quality models, uh, controlling point sources, monitoring. Um, so the answer is that really all of those things are needed for an effective air quality management plan. Um, so obviously controlling emissions is important, but in order to identify um, which emission controls will be the most effective uh, and therefore will have the least disruption to the economy or um, be, you know, cause the least problems. Um, modeling is necessary. You know, uh, Professor Fiore uh, alluded to the fact that the response of air pollution to changes in emissions is not linear. And so it's not simply a matter that we, you know, we see particles in the air, we say, okay, this one came from that car, we'll stop driving that car now. You know, it's, it's much more complex than that. Most of the particulate matter in the atmosphere, for example, um, originates as gases that are emitted and then they react together and then there's a phase transformations, physics and chemistry, and then eventually we have particles. So um, <clears throat> the modeling is there to uh, kind of support this diagnosis of what will the most effective point controls be. And then the question about monitoring, um, monitoring is absolutely necessary in the sense that if you don't have the before and after picture, how do you know if your emissions controls have, have had any positive effect, right? Um, but then also um, there's, it, it can be part of the origin story of the control as well, right? So what we're seeing in um, Africa with the work, very important work that Dan is doing is that if there's no data, it's very difficult to motivate any, uh, any change, right? Because emissions controls are, are costly, not always politically popular. Um, but if you have the data showing how much people's lives and in fact, the economy are being impacted by this uh, elevated levels of pollution, that's how you get the ball rolling. Um, there absolutely are some people who are jumping on the bandwagon of, of manufacturing um, uh, monitors for, you know, as a, a business pr proposition. I, I, I feel like there's something about the policies in India that's encouraging that actually. There's a move towards using um, domestically produced sensors rather than the international well-established ones, which of course are, are more expensive. Yeah, I think I think that they're all part of the the equation, but there there has to be kind of a logic to how everything fits together. I'll speak very briefly about particulate matter air pollution in India, and I also wanted to wish everybody a, a happy festival season. I have my my rangoli there and my cover slide. You know, as as we mentioned in the introduction, um, air quality is at a crisis level in in India. This is data that's from the year 2019. So of course it's, it's very widely publicized, particularly in Delhi, um, that 
much of the year air pollution is is elevated to a point where it's not healthy to breathe across the the endogangetic plane um, we see similar things particularly very extreme air pollution episodes in the winter but then even in areas which are cleaner on on a whole there's still major periods of the year where people are exposed to elevated levels of, of pollution that's harming health so in uh, 2017, we this was back when I think awareness of air pollution was just starting to uh, increase in India, and the government locally and centrally uh, was just beginning to invest in, in monitoring. We did the a retrospective of the first full year of data, and um, on the left, that's what you see there. So this was published in HuffPost India. And we went back and revisited this exercise this summer. So this is data for you know the full year of 2019. You can see lots of differences. One important one being that there's many, there's a lot more data. Um, so there are many fewer empty spots on the, the map than there were before. Of course, central India, where there's a lot of uh, industrial activity, there's still a bit of emptiness there. Um, but there's there's more information, people more awareness. We've got coverage in in eastern India now. That's great. Um, you can see some improvements. So some areas, uh, air pollution. There seems to be some traction, um, but other other places maybe things have have gone downhill a bit. But without this kind of information, we wouldn't be able to identify these trends. Um, talking about the impact of of the COVID lockdowns on India. Um, so what we did was compare. This is all government, Indian government data, by the way, that we're, we're analyzing. It's made publicly available. Um, so data for the, the lockdown period, you know, we use the exact dates in March and May for the intense lockdown period. Um, so comparing that period in 2020 to the same period in 2019, and we also did 2018, it was fairly similar. You can see there were um, decreases in the fine particulate matter concentrations um, in almost everywhere in India. It's not 100% and it's not uniform necessarily. And the reason why is that there are many different sources for um, PM 2.5. So the things that changed during lockdown were traffic, so mobile emissions, um, some industrial emissions if you know factories and other things were shut down. But um, one of the main sources of, of particulate matter pollution in India is um, residential use, especially um, burning solid fuels in the home um, for cooking and things like that. And obviously people still had to eat and, and warm their homes uh, you know, during the lockdown. Well, maybe not warm, I guess, suppose it was hot in, in India by, by March. Um, but these kinds of sources, also agricultural burning, major sources did not necessarily change because of the COVID lockdown. We've been doing some work as part of the Clean Air Toolbox project that Dan mentioned specifically in Kolkata. Um, we started there. Uh, it's a very, very large, but secondary city in, in India. So it hasn't received as much attention um, internationally, I would say as, as Delhi has for its air pollution. Um, it has a very large you know, number of sources locally, but also Kolkata is in the outflow of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. So it's experiencing, you know, kind of the downstream effects of, of that big North Indian pollution cloud. You know, I also have a, a strong personal connection to Kolkata. My husband is from there. And so I've been traveling there for many years and, um, you know, I feel a connection to the city. So um, this is a map of kind of a hybrid monitoring network in, in Kolkata. So uh, the West Bengal Pollution Control Board has a network of, of several government reference grade monitors. Uh, you know, Dan talked about this uh, difference between the types of monitors that are available. Um, so there are these reference grade monitors in a few locations across the city, but there are opportunities for a higher spatial resolution, um, more time resolution if, if we also use low cost monitors. So um, we've been partnering with a startup company in Kolkata that deployed a, a network in 2018 and 2019. Those are the, the green spots there. They were mainly focusing on a few main um, traffic arteries there. And then we um, also have set up some of our own monitors in, in, I would say kind of the outer belt around, it's still in the city, but, but not quite in that uh, high traffic zone. So the purple spots are, are our own purple air sensors. Quick overview of what we're doing in Kolkata, we have, um, we're working with those low cost monitoring networks and, and the data. Those are my, my sons setting up one of our, our sensors in, in Salt, or no, that one's in Baliganj. Um, 
so we're, we're working on data science techniques to get the highest quality data possible um, from these low cost monitoring networks, very much along the lines of what um, Dan described in, in Kinshasa. Um, we also have a team from the law school working on um, analyzing the, the policy landscape for, for opportunities for regulation. Um, you can see we're just entering the kind of air pollution season, unfortunately, in, in India right now. This is the data from last year um, from our pollution network. Uh, Durga Puja was, was a lot earlier last year, right? So it was actually before the end of the, the monsoon. Um, so we may see more of an effect. It, of course, everything is different this year because of COVID. Um, and in fact, we hope there's less outdoor activity, um, even though it's sad to miss out on this joyous occasion. But, and of course, Diwali is always a, a high point when it comes to air pollution, but of course it's, it's not the only cause of the air pollution issues in, in November each year. There's um, agricultural burning that takes place at the same point. And of course, the, just the meteorological situation in North India in that time is a recipe for high air pollution. I'll also just say that um, we have just started a project with funded by the USAID in collaboration with the World Resources Institute and the Environmental Defense Fund. And we'll be working in Indoor, that's a city that was chosen by USAID um, to identify some uh, the sources of air pollution there. Thanks, Faye, over to you, Aileen. On this slide, I thought that I would just uh, take a moment to, to mention that some of you may very well have seen um, the, the pictures on the left, which are taken looking at a building in Beijing. Um, and this was a, a real citizen science um, effort that raised awareness of the number of days. Basically, a picture was taken every single day out the same window, the same view, and calendars were constructed for every day of the year so that you could very visually easily see um, how often pollution was occurring in Beijing. And I, I have to say, I use these figures in my teaching a lot because I, I find that it just readily communicates the, the scale of the problem. Um, and then I also just wanted to show the, the pictures that Dan Westervelt had taken during a visit to the Mumbai Global Center back in 2016. And you can see in the bottom panel that you can actually see the buildings across the bay, whereas in the top panel, when these uh, concentrations of fine particles are twice as high, uh, you can't even tell really what's, that there is anything um, in the distance. So before jumping into a little bit on COVID period air pollution responses, I thought it would help to place um, these changes in somewhat of a longer term context, because as we spoke about at the beginning, there have been major changes happening in air pollution um, over Asia and really around the world um, over the last decade. And one of the tools that we have at our disposal now to look at changes in air pollution comes from satellites that are continuously orbiting. And our current fleet gives us kind of a once a day observation. These are showing us um, the gas sulfur dioxide and that is a precursor gas that through atmospheric chemistry converts into particulate matter. And the two maps are showing 2005 versus 2016. And conveniently, we can look at the same time at these maps at both China and India. And it should be hopefully very obvious that there's a lot more pink and purple on the left over North China than there is on the right panel. And so this is a direct consequence of targeted uh, policies to reduce SO2 emissions given the air pollution awareness that was raised kind of beginning in 2013. And we see that estimates of the actual emissions of sulfur dioxide have decreased by a factor four over this period. Whereas in India, we see that those um, emissions have almost doubled. And we see this growth of SO2 from 2005 to 2016. Of course, as Professor McNeil mentioned, uh, this has, has begun to, to turn around a little bit in terms of awareness within India in recent years. Um, I also wanted to show you um, as something that is a ga another gas that's retrieved from space that goes on to make ozone smog, and this is nitrogen dioxide. And here we're looking at changes from 2005 to 2015 over India on the left and over um, eastern China on the right-hand side. And the story here is somewhat similar that we see increases over many regions in India. We also see for this time period increases over that North China Plain region 
Um, but we also see a lot of a fair bit of blue over specific cities where targeted air pollution controls were put into place to reduce ozone as well as um, this NO2 can all, or nitrogen dioxide also goes on to contribute to particle formation. And in my own research group, uh, this is work with a, a graduate student who just uh, finished up this past summer. We have other compounds that are retrieved from space um, that we can use to get a little more insight into ozone on the ground. And actually an important point that I should have made is we actually can't retrieve ozone smog or fine particles from space directly at the surface. So we use these other quantities that are retrieved from space to learn as much as we can about what's actually going on on the ground. Um, and so this, is, this gets into some of the chemistry that's involved in ozone formation, but really the thing to take away here is that the three different colors are telling us about three different kind of sets of chemistry or what we tend to call chemical regimes in which ozone forms. And so what we can see is that between 2005 and 2015, there have been some places that have switched into different um, chemical regimes for ozone formation. And one of the silver linings of this very dark COVID period that the world is going through is that it provides us with new opportunities to understand the chemistry that's controlling air pollution formation. Um, a catch there, though, is that if we really want to be able to nail down what that chemistry is, um, we need to understand what the actual emission changes are, um, as well as the chemistry. And so these are these are kind of opportunities for science um, that that we think are going to come out of the atmospheric chemistry research community and probably wider communities uh, from the COVID period. OK, so this is now look, using uh, quantities retrieved from space during the COVID period, just doing a simple difference between uh, 2020 and 2019. And on the left are these tropospheric nitrogen dioxide columns over China, and we see these dramatic decreases in the January and February during the city lockdown period. And then we see that actually in March and April, the decreases have really lessened a lot. And this is as the cities were opening up again within China. Um, so the, on the right hand side, we see aerosol optical depth, which tells us something about the level of particles that are in the atmosphere. And we see that in much of eastern China, those are decreasing. Um, however, we also notice that there's increases that don't really seem to line up with uh, the changes in nitrogen dioxide on the left. And so this raises questions about how much of what we're actually viewing from space or from measurements on the ground is actually due to the emission changes associated with the lockdown versus what, what is associated with changes in weather patterns from year to year, or what might even reflect longer term trends. And an interesting finding that's been coming out is that in this northern uh, China area is that increases in winter wintertime haze as well as ozone were observed um, at the same time as these city lockdowns were happening. And so this is an example of where the weather has come into play to create conditions favorable to pollution formation. And in addition, there's these nonlinear responses that sometimes the chemistry is in a state where as you reduce the precursor gas emissions, you end up increasing the secondary formation. So there's a lot of lessons here that are being learned, and I, I, I imagine will continue to be learned from this period in the years to come. And so this is just an example um, from a, a paper that we had contributed to that tries to place these pollution changes in the broader context of our energy systems that generate different emissions and also linked to climate. And just very, very briefly, um, the punchline here is that this improvement in air quality that we've noticed um, around the world in various cities during COVID-19 is unfortunately not enough to really slow our climate change. And so the left panel is just showing the change in cumulative carbon dioxide emissions um, from January through April of 2020 versus 2019. And we see that these changes globally are less than 8%. And if you focus on the blue line, which is the total global temperature change, um, if these types of COVID related emission changes were to last for about two years, we see that globally this 
cools the planet by less than one one hundredth of a degree. So clearly we need much bigger, more la longer lasting CO2 changes. And just to wrap up in the next slide, I wanted to note that one way that we're filling some of the data gap that Dan and Faye have talked about on the ground is through um, satellites that do view globally. And if we can learn enough as to how to connect what we see from space with what we're measuring on the ground, we have real power there to, to fill in those, those gaps in, in coverage of our monitoring networks on the ground. And satellites have been moving towards higher and higher resolution, although the current fleet mostly provides a once per day glimpse. What we're very, very excited about is the opportunity to have continuous coverage where we get hourly measurements that can allow us to follow pollution from morning rush hour through the course of the day and see how it's evolving in real time. And the Koreans in February of this year launched the first ever geostationary satellite, which means that it's going to stare continuously over the Asian region shown in the black box here. Um, and then soon we expect within the next couple of years to also have an instrument staring over North America as well as Europe. Um, however, of course, we'd really love to have this as well over Africa and South America and Australia so that we have this globally, but at least our, our once, per, once per day orbiting satellites will continue to provide data and help us link what we learn from these new satellites in the northern hemisphere uh, with air quality around the globe. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward to more questions. Um, thank you everybody. Um, you pointed out how, you know, Arlene, you pointed out how the comparative and the broad the macro view from these satellite images on, you know, Faye and Danny have also talked about like almost the micro grid, you know, from monitoring very locally is very, very important to, for us to get a holistic picture so that action can be more doable. Um, and that, you know, broader changes are equally important as, you know, temporary ones in that sense, you know, we need a holistic kind of plan. So I'm, I'm wondering about the role of the government here, both, both at the national and the city level. When so much is at stake and air pollution is, you know, in some ways seen as a stigma to, uh, to a way of governance in a city or, a, or, or in, a, in a nation um, and its economic policies, how do you, as research scientists who have obviously to be working with the government or how do, how do scientists in general work with the government and what, what has been successful government in, interventions? I'll, I'll just quickly say that um, my experience working with air quality managers has largely been in the United States. Um, and there's, you know, clearly this has been a system that's been developed for several decades now. Um, but there, there are kind of clear pathways through which re scientific research happening in academia and actually um, work at consulting companies in the private sector um, interacts with, with the government agencies um, in the US. And this occurs through analysis of data, publishing scientific studies. Um, in the US, there's, there's a, a very clear process through which scientific research is evaluated and national ambient air quality standards are, are assessed and, and, and can be revised in light of the latest you know, health-based research um, as well as you know, air quality research. Um, and there's also opportunities on the implementation side to work with state and local agencies. And so part of this, this NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team that I've been part of is we're are working with those stakeholder groups and trying to um, not just provide information, but really help to build capacity so that they can go analyze the publicly available data sets, including those from space. So maybe I'll stop there and pass on to my colleagues. Yeah, Faye, would you like to? address that or Dan? Yeah. yeah, I think Dan has more to say about it, but I, I will say that we've um, had, you know, success in Kolkata collaborating with the West Bengal Pollution Control Board and, you know, our, our cooperation and interaction with them, you know, first of all, it's, it's needed because we're, you know, we're kind of partners in trying to gather this data set and, and understand the, the problem, um, but also because um, since our goal is, is to develop these solutions for, for air pollution, they'll ultimately be the ones implementing it, right? So um, we have a partnership in which we're, you know, really going to them and, and asking, you know, what kind of support do you need? And I, we've found that they're quite open, you know, because there's a big problem to be tackled and, and they're looking for, for support and suggestions. 
Um, so I, I think that there's definitely a, um, I, I think that that's the right approach in this case. I think everything that's been said is, is correct. And um, I'll just add that, you know, I think providing capacity building and training targeted specifically for um, policymakers and decision makers and, and things like that is, is a key uh, way to, to move forward as well. And so as an example, I spent uh, two weeks with the Ghanaian Environmental Protection Agency in Accra, Ghana, um, basically training them on different aspects of air quality. And one thing that they were really interested in was air quality forecasting, uh, which is not which is done commonly like in the US, but it, it's not really done much in Ghana and probably not in many other places in Africa. Um, and so that training kind of gives them an option now to start thinking about providing air quality forecasts, which is a sort of government government level policy that then can be used to provide early warning systems, early warning messages to citizens to tell them like, hey, you know, today is going to be a pretty bad air quality day. Maybe you should skip your strenuous outdoor activity or, or do it later, do it at night, you know, do it tomorrow, something like that. I think that, you know, providing, working closely and embedding yourself with the uh, folks like, you know, environmental protection agencies and things like that can have a, uh, a good sort of impact and could lead them to, you know, developing policies that may help reduce exposure to air pollution. Thanks, Dan. And while I have you, um, you know, one of them, and perhaps this is going to be the final question because it's, um, you know, we're almost out of time. Um, could you tell us, you know, what what citizens could do or what the private sector could do and, you know, what they, what they could do in, in, in working in this manner, in, in addressing air quality together with the scientists or the government? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I guess I'll start off with the, the private sector. I mean, the private sector, a lot of the monitoring that we do, you know, comes from the private sector, the, the engineering companies that, you know, build these devices that then um, are used to, to know how, how bad the air quality is. You know, the private sector also has a role in sort of the solutions as well, which is like, you know, clean energy and, and things like that. You know, not, it doesn't all the, always work out that way. You know, there's all, obviously a, a large private sector in fossil fuels and things like that. But um, hopefully there's, you know, in the future, we have more innovation for um, cleaner energy from, from private corporations. And then in terms of citizens, um, you know, things, things like personal actions, uh, you know, driving less, et cetera, like that's, that's all well and good. Um, but I think, you know, this is just my opinion, but in order to make more appreciable changes, you really need government level cooperation, or sometimes even like multinational cooperation, you know, it's, it's not always just one country, it needs to be like a cohort of countries since pollution doesn't really respect borders all the time. So I, you know, it sounds simple, but one thing that people can do is just uh, elect or, or encourage public officials to uh, enact policies that will reduce emissions. And I think that's a really big thing in, you know, in, in the US, for example, and probably in India as well. And yeah, and then I, you know, even on a on a on a lower uh, on another scale, you could talk about just just raising awareness. Um, you know, just speaking about these issues, whether it's air quality or climate change or uh, clean energy. You know, speaking about it with your friends and family, and I, I, it can be an uncomfortable topic sometimes, especially among family. But uh, the more you can sort of discuss these things openly, you know, the better that people can be aware because in a lot of a lot of cases people are just sort of ignorant of you know the issues they just don't know like uh you know how how bad the air quality can be in, in certain areas so yeah thanks thanks dan arlene to you and then we'll end with Faye. yeah maybe one of the ways to to broach these conversations that we're having and raising awareness is also just to keep in mind why it's so urgent to address air quality um and so one of the things that, that kind of continually impresses upon me is that the, the research that comes out of the health community just continually shows more and more health effects and that there really doesn't seem to be a safe level of exposure to air pollution. And that's really what's 
driven the continual tightening of standards in, in many nations around the world. Um, and the other aspect there is sort of the link between the climate change and air pollution problems. And that is that what we're understanding about how climate change will feed back on air quality um, suggests that there's a lot of urgency to continue cleaning up our air. And so there's, um, you know, we sort of talked about, Faye mentioned as well as um, I mentioned the sort of area in China where meteorological conditions kind of come together, you know, in October, November every year in India um, to, to just favor the buildup and the formation of air pollution. And it seems like in, in some, in a lot of regions, warmer, a warmer climate will exacerbate that. And in addition, we know that there are feedbacks through things like wildfires. Um, you know, this, I don't know how much it hit the international news, but in September, October, the air quality in California in the Western US was probably some of the worst anywhere in the world because of the fires that were raging that have been linked to climate change. I completely agree with what my colleagues have said. Um, <clears throat> I think you know, awareness is a big challenge in India and, and Africa. I think that in if, if you've traveled to China or some of you may be in China, um, awareness is actually quite high for, for air pollution. You know, everybody's got their app. You know, they decide whether to wear a mask when they go outside. Well, this year, everybody has to. But, you know, previously, um, <clears throat> you know, the mask wearing was very much part of the culture. Um, you know, I, I think that an issue I find in India is that you know, there, there's a, a number of things to be concerned about, right? There's a hierarchy of crises that, that people may be focusing their attention on and it's exhausting. And I, th I think that this year, you know, we're, we're all seeing this in, in 2020, right? So, um, you know, in, in Kolkata, our, our partners are, you know, dealing with the lockdown, dealing with COVID. Um, you know, some of our, our sensors were knocked down by the typhoon. Um, there's, there's a lot going on, right? Um, and, and I think that, that sometimes uh, air pollution, you know, it, it feels ambient almost, you could, you could ignore it. But, um, you know, if, if we continue to, to keep awareness and, and the front burner in terms of understanding how this is affecting our, our health and the baseline and how we want, um, Things to be for for the vulnerable people in our population, that children and and elderly moving forward. Um, I, I think that there's a real potential for change. Thank you, everybody. You've you've brought up you know a lot for us to think about about what we can do through actions in terms of awareness, in terms of using our vote effectively, also in terms of lifestyle changes, and that you know um, governments could benefit from partnership with um, with the scientific community um, in getting data, in finding out the best course of action and the plan of action, and that this is urgent for our public health and for the health of our planet now. So thank you very much to our panelists and our wonderful audience.